You are now listening to Sanity at the Movies. Thor, Love and Thunder? Or Boar, Love and Blunder? We're going to find out today. And this is part of our series of Russian roulette movies <laughs> where one of us takes the bullet. And, and I was the one who had to take this bullet, and buddy... Was it a bullet? Was it a bullet to oh the my brain? Goodness. Okay, well, this is Sanity Death Movies. I am Nathan, your humble and obedient. Oh, that is Jake, the pastor who's a master of cinema, and he took the Thor Love and Thunder bullet, and he is here to talk about it. Oh, today. man, am I here to talk about it? I can't tell you how much I hated that movie and how disappointed I was. We, I guess we should, so franchise thoughts. Let's see. People, of course, probably know our Marvel, but if somebody's, this is somebody's entry point for some ridiculous reason, it's fair to say, I guess we we're okay with Marvel through the first three phases, and we're into it. Like, yeah, normal. It, was, it was pretty fun. And yeah, pretty worth engaging in. And, and had its problems, had its wokeism, had its this, had its that. Mm-hmm. And you can find plenty of evidence of our thoughts in, in previous. But Marvel Phase Four. I mean, well, we should talk about two things: two two bits of baggage: the Thor baggage and the Phase Four baggage. So, what is your Thor baggage, Jake? My Thor baggage. Yeah. Hang on a second. I'm going to, somebody was messing with my microphone. Yeah, well, we had, we've had many exciting things happen in this Top Secret Studio B since last <clears> we spoke. <throat> there, I think it's better now. Yay. Okay, so Thor can Baggage. I a little bit more volume in my headphones. You too? can. There you Thanks. go. All right, that's better. So I, I've got a soft spot for Thor as a character. Hey, look, you turned down all the ambient noise. I, I've got a soft spot for making great podcasts. Yeah, Audio. Good. All right, we are adjusting to a studio that has been used for other things. We are adjusting to a studio, and we are adjusting to new studio technology. All at the same time. All at the same time. (laughs) Yep, that's me. Yep. (laughs) Sitting (laughs) in a studio. You're probably wondering how I got (laughs) here. Yep. The the new technology involves a soundboard that allows me to do wonderful things like that that add so much to these podcasts. That was a sweet gift. Yeah, it was a sweet gift. So, yeah, it just showed up at our studio. Mm -hmm. Yay. So I like Thor just as a character. I like Chris Hemsworth. I don't have any illusions that he's some great actor. I just like him, I think. I, maybe I like him because I don't like Chris Evans and I don't like Chris Pratt. And well, uh, Evans and Pratt both, whatever you think of their characters and some of their movies are great, but they don't seem like they'd actually be good hangs. Whereas Chris Hemsworth feels he just like seems he, like a pretty fun guy a great hang. and a pretty good dad and a pretty good husband and just kind of a, a generally sweet, cool bro kind of dude. You got that surfer bro energy, but but not in a bad way. Yeah, so I just kind of like him. And I think that there's a humility to the way that he approaches his movies that's pretty self-deprecating that I like too. Or I think I think he knows he's just a pretty boy with big muscles and... He's honed a little bit of comedic timing skills, and mm-hmm. he doesn't really have much more to bring to the table than that. Seems to know it. Doesn't try to do too much. Doesn't try to get too far outside of himself or reach beyond him. Just kind of lives there in a way that I think is pretty humble. It's not the same kind of level of pretension of a Chris Evans who's like, well, he actually, as an actor, doesn't bring that much more to the table either. Right. But he's sure going to try and sure going to try to prove himself as an actor and he and ruffalo will be the first ones to have some abortion statement after they're they're really obnoxious right they're gonna they're gonna use their platform for politics and all that sort of this is gross and icky and chris pratt's an icky guy and yeah i mean well we don't have to litigate pratt today but but so i don't know he's like one of the more and then there's Chris Pine. He's not in the marvel universe but he's a pretty good actor but jack ryan shadow recruit you never saw that one. Directed uh, by Kenneth Branagh, director of the first Thor movie. Yeah, which was fine in and of itself, but also terrible. Yeah, I didn't care. For, I mean, I was not in on the Marvel thing. I, I did actually see them. I didn't like, I think you saw Avengers and then went back and filled some stuff in because you're like, that's oh. right. Yeah. I did not do that. I did see them as they came out. But Thor was the one where I was just like, come on, Asgard. Full Nathan movie snob, I guess you could say. It was like, Asgard doesn't feel like a place. There's nothing going on here. You can say this is just fun kind of Power Rangers stuff for the kids, but couldn't you have done another dialogue? You know, you, Can you, you have been a little more imaginative? Yeah, yeah, you got Kenneth Branagh. Why not go for the quasi-Shakespearean thing? Like, 
not not in a pretentious way but just have fun with it and go a little bit more over the top be a little campier bring the the venture the energy that kate blanchett eventually brought like do do right which was great and that that's i think the real turning point and maybe if i say that i love and have affection for thor maybe all i really mean is i really had a lot of fun at thor ragnarok and kate blanchett was awesome and the buddy energy between ruffalo and hemsworth with tom hiddleston over there and Tessa Thompson, I guess. And then the introduction of, uh, of Korg and Meek. And mm-hmm. there's just a lot of great... Inf- and then Jeff Goldblum being his gay weird self. And it was funny. It was fun. It still was in a Marvel universe that believed in heroes and believed in fathers. And so while it was a little transgressive and played with the genre a little bit, it didn't really disrespect the genre or disrespect Thor moment to moment. It had the most sort of, of the Marvel. We deflate things jokes of, of almost any of them. And yet it didn't ultimately end up the cumulative effect did not def- deflate Thor. Maybe it's just cause he powers up. He has a Campbellian power up at the end and we get these like got lightning powers and we hear the song, yeah. the, the Led Zeppelin song. All that kind of stuff. That movie did moment to moment. It had a lot of like, I'm a hero. And then he, he a ball throws hits a him ball in the head. and it bounces back and hits him in the head. Yeah. But I don't know. The twee kind of humor of what's his face. Psycho like It felt a little fresh at that time. And yeah, it was like, it was like what James Gunn did, but without the anger and the aggression and the meanness. Yeah. Yeah. You know? exactly. And so that was just like, it was fresh and cool and fun and enjoyable and enjoyable in and of itself. And one of the more visually appealing. Yeah. Very Marvel pretty movies. and colorful. And outside of James Gunn, one of the only ones that felt like it had an actual visual aesthetic right. to it. Right. Yeah. I actually, I, I have a soft spot for, I just want to throw this out. It's Thor dark, dark world. I, I actually, Is that right? I actually enjoyed that movie. I only saw it the once in theaters, but I got out and I was like, yeah, that was fun. I don't know. Maybe I was just in a good mood that day for some reason. Must have been because you got out of Ragnarok and hated it. And yeah, maybe, maybe I was just in a bad mood that that day. Yeah. I agree with the world that Ragnarok is great. So that's Thor baggage and then Marvel Phase 4 baggage. Oh, shoot. Have I seen any Marvel Phase 4? I guess I saw we had to you see Shang-Chi yeah. and we saw, I had to see the Spider-Man thing. Yeah. I think that's... Yeah, I guess does the Loki show in the WandaVision show, does that count as Phase 4? Yeah, I guess so. Okay, so we watched WandaVision and we watched Loki, and that's it. I have not seen Black Widow. I've not seen Eternals. I've not seen the Hawkeye show. I've not seen the Falcon and the Winter Soldier show. I've not seen, is there more? Ms. Marvel? Well, Doctor seen, Strange and the Multiverse I've of not Madness. I've seen Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, even. Yeah, I mean. I just don't care. Yeah. I just stop caring. It's, 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 if you had said. Five years ago, you're going to be completely out. I mean, maybe the signs were signposts were already there, and we would have believed you. But the extent to which it just doesn't matter, mm. and we don't care. Just don't care. Just not interested and not bothered by. I mean, I have a big time completionist streak in me, and it is not even remotely triggered by this phase. It's like, well, they've gone multiverse and they've gone woke and in all the worst possible ways. And it's like, so nothing matters. Nothing's at stake. There are no fathers. There are no heroes. We don't believe any in any of that stuff anymore. Well, and good and evil are so completely arbitrary that the stories just aren't fun. There's nothing to push against. People are behaving in random ways. Every, basically, every Phase 4 movie has been like this. Chong chi it's like, are you supposed to feel sympathetic for the dad or mad at the dad? The, the movie never really decides. And it was one of the more solid well-structured entries but it was still just yeah a mess just just bad i could use a little bit more volume in my headphones so that brings us to thor love and thunder a movie that you saw a movie that i saw and i should have gone and seen the new top gun movie instead and except i had a job to do and i was excited about it it's the only movie i was gonna be happy to see and in this Marvel set. The idea that they're going to give Thor back to me after the Russos took him away. Right. Maybe there's somebody worth caring about, caring about still in the, in the MCU. And, and man, and, and, and Tyke's fun. He did a fun job with Ragnarok. Yeah. And, and this movie is just like, 
Oh, man, I don't even know where to start. Well, let me say my expectations. I expected that, okay, it's probably going to be a mess based on the trailer. It looks like there's just too much going on, and that's been a problem with every Phase 4 movie and just a Marvel comic book problem in general. And especially as these stories get more... It's why they always reset the continuity in the comics. Every 10 years or so, they have to just have some event or, or that or where it's like, Thanos or somebody does something, and we're all in a metaverse where Peter's a kid again, and... All the uh, Tony Stark's ability, like they have to reset everything because it just gets too convoluted. So I thought it would be a mess, and I thought that it would be uh, obviously feminist, given the Mighty Thor Jane storyline, and obviously woke and annoying, and it would probably have some lesbian or okay, trans yeah, stuff. You want to talk about that stuff? Let's talk about that stuff. So not only does uh, Jane become the Mighty Thor, she becomes the Mighty Thor because of love. Oh, right. So. It, the movie begins with like Korg is going to get uh, spoilers, by the way, folks. Yeah, all spoilers. Jake hated the movie if you just want to take without the spoilers, but yeah, so Korg's going to spend, I don't know, 10 or 20 minutes like recapping everything that's happened to Thor. And then they're going to have to use a bunch of new footage to talk about Thor and Jane's great romantic relationship that we never really get to see much of on screen. Mm -hmm. And so everything else is like used uh, footage from other movies and there's a little bit of footage of Thor and Jane from other movies, but also a whole bunch of scenes that they just had to, had to write and create. To do do some, we get fingers crossed some Darcy doing some hilarious riffing? We get some Darcy. It's not very hilarious, but she does make a little cameo, a little appearance. She makes an appearance at Jane's side while she's in chemo. Uh. And so she's got cancer and she's dying and one of the things that is new is that actually Molnir and Stormbreaker are characters now and they have personalities and you can talk to them and they like act. They're actors. So like, it's just like the standard like Doctor Strange cape or exactly. Uh, we've got a number of objects that kind of behave like carpet and Aladdin. Exactly right. So Stormbreaker is a very sensitive individual who like floats up and is looking over Thor's shoulder as he eyes Mjolnir, who's put back together. So let me explain how that all happens, I guess. But apparently back in the day, Thor made Mjolnir promise, or promise told Mjolnir to always protect Jane because he loved her. And so now Jane's sick, and Mjolnir calls to Jane, and they've got this like display case of all the pieces of Mjolnir that can't be picked up because only he who is worthy can pick up even the pieces of Mjolnir, apparently. So it's like a display case around the grass where all the pieces of Mjolnir fell when Hela crushed it. And when Jane shows up, Mjolnir re reassembles. And she's now the mighty Thor, and it gives her power and protects her, or so it would seem, at least so long as she has Mjolnir. And now Mjolnir, because it's broken into a million pieces, can like fly off into a thousand little... Pieces like bullets and shoot through bad monster enemies, which is a cool idea. So that's that's Jane, and so she's awesome and strong and powerful now. And but I, I'm just gonna take a wild guess if she ever gives it up, if she ever stops being Thor, she'll die. That's right, except for the fact that the presence of Molnir also inhibits her body from fighting the cancer. So. It can prop her up, but it's also accelerating her death hmm. unless or making it impossible for her to be healed. So if she keeps up taking up Molnir, she can never let it go. And so eventually, but eventually taking up Molnir and keeping Molnir will just result in her death. So it's super convoluted because we really needed Jane to die as a hero by taking up Molnir and not giving up Molnir at the end of the movie. Right. So this just feels really like constructed and clunky. But since we're talking about wokeness, let's see. Uh, both Valkyrie and Korg are openly gay. Tessa Thompson's dressing in suits and she's king and she's looking for her queen. And so she's just sort of like trans. And then we have a conversation with her and Korg where Korg is talking about her girlfriends that she's had and the ways that she's used them as a cover for the fact that she lost her lover back when Hela killed her. And then Korg tells us about how he has two dads 
and how his species is just men. He goes into describing the lovemaking process, which is like you go down into like a volcano and you hold hands in front of molten lava. And, and so, and then by the end of the movie, he's found a dude that he loves who has a mustache and it's weird. His name's Dwayne or something like that. So anyhow, we've got a very openly gay, two openly gay characters in the movie. And then Jane is all muscly and stuff. And, and Thor is a broken sort of cuckolded dude who's got to figure out how to have a relationship with his ex who's now super powerful. And he starts out with the Guardians of the Galaxy and he is just a lost little boy who's still super powerful but super depressed and doesn't fit in the found family that's the Guardians of the Galaxy and gives speeches that nobody understands or cares about and it's really stupid. And by the end of the movie, we realize that... There are all kinds of ways we protect ourselves from love, and that's and at the end of the but at the end of the day, we just want to be loved. That's the reason why Thor is such a sad, depressed, lonely person, and why Jane is such a hard workaholic, and why our villain Gore, the God Butcher, played by Christian Bale, is so angry because he lost his daughter, and the gods didn't that he w- was devoted to didn't help him. So that, mm. And then he got special powers and decided to go kill them all, to butcher them, butcher them all as a god butcher would. And so the end of the movie, Thor leaves Jane in the hospital bed and tells her not to follow because he can't lose her again. And he promises to come back and then he goes and gets in trouble and Jane somehow magically senses it because we do that sort of thing in this universe. And then she decides to take up Molnir and die well, saving Thor, which she does. And, but Gore the God Butcher still wins and he gets, he makes his way to eternity, which is this thing at the heart of the galaxy. It's the MacGuffin that if he gets it, he can get his one wish, his Thanos snap and his Thanos snap would be to kill all the gods or I guess could still try to stop him. But instead he turns and he goes to Jane to hold her as she dies and basically gives a speech that says, we just want to be loved, and I've spent my life protecting myself from love and hardening myself and living in denial and being depressed. And love makes you feel bad sometimes, but that's okay. And Sounds like a spiritual sequel to, I don't remember either of their names, Chick making dude, black dude, not sacrifice himself because love wins in uh, yeah. Star Wars. Finn and Rose. Finn and Rose, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it's kind of like that. I mean, he just goes and it, he's like going to hold Jane and be like, well, you won. I guess if you're going to kill me, I want to die with the one that I love. And you don't have to make this choice. You could actually choose love. And instead of getting vengeance, you could get your daughter back. And he's like, I'm dying too because you broke my special sword that has, is bound to my life force. And so there'll be no way to take care of her. And Jane's all like... Yes, there is. And Thor looks at her and at him and is like, yeah, I'll take care of your daughter. And then Gore's crying and the daughter comes back. I mean, in, in, and he has a flashback to make sure we know, even though we saw it at the beginning of the movie, that Thor is holding Jane the same way that he was holding his daughter when his daughter died in the desert. And so he sees it. He sees Thor and his daughter the whole movie, Thor is trying to protect the children and get the children. Gore snatched the Asgardian children to bait Thor into a trap to kill him and take Stormbreaker, which is the key to this is all overcomplicated movie plot. Right. And so he decides, fine, I choose love. I can choose love. It's not too late, actually, to choose love. Even I, Gore the God Butcher, is responsible for abducting and murdering children and thousands of and uh, gods and whatever with my necro sword can choose love and be redeemed. And so my daughter comes back and she gets to hold me as I die. And then, uh, yay, now she's a god and like Thor and he's thunder and she's love and he's a single dad and he's going to teach her all the things. Yay. And yay, love wins. And so. Is, I'm trying to 
figure out without having seen this, just as I hear you talk, is there a coherent bad message here or is this just a bunch of gobbledygook? The coherent message is that it has is all everybody just wants to be and to feel loved. And there are a thousand ways that we protect ourselves from it and don't want to be vulnerable to it because it makes us feel bad. And because heartbreak sucks Mm -hmm. and people who are out to get their vengeance on the world are just people who have had a lot of heartbreak and don't trust that love is safe or that they can give themselves to love. And people that are workaholics are people that choose to drown themselves in work to avoid love. And people like Valkyrie who give themselves to lovers in casual affairs and to being drunk all the time are doing it because they are covering up the pain of lost love and are afraid of being that vulnerable again because it sucks when people you love are killed in front of you. And Thor becomes a depressed, horrible person, not horrible person, but a depressed person who doesn't know what to do with himself because he's lost his, as Korg recounts for us in a series of flashbacks that's supposed to be hilarious. He lost his mom and his dad and his brother and his brother again and his brother again and Jane and his friend, Tony, and all the things. Mm -hmm. And so he's pretty much lost everyone and half of all of Asgard and his home planet and Heimdall and a bunch of people that, haha, we told you you were supposed to care about, but actually you don't care about like what's his face and what's his face and what's his face, which is how Korg reminds us of him as we skip to Hela killing them in Ragnarok. Sure. So it's just a lonely, depressed, sad boy. And, but he finds love again at the end, both he and Jane are reconciled and healed. And then now he's got a little baby girl to take care of as a single dad. And so at the end of the day, the message is we just all want to feel loved and accepted. And there are all kinds of ways that we get hurt and all kinds of ways that we are, that we put up walls and protect ourselves and hide from being vulnerable to love and to the pain that comes with love. And all of us from the worst of us to the best of us, to the most hardworking of us, to the drunkards among us, really all we need is love. And it takes some real guts and courage and the real, real heroes, real heroes are the people that are just willing to embrace the pain that is love. I mean, I guess I could see a good movie being made with that theme. I mean, it, there are parts of it that are done in enough of an emotionally cathartic way that I think it may have gotten some tears out of me. It didn't make me like the movie in any way, shape or form. Well, it's just like so many of so much of Marvel's messaging, if you want to call it that it's like some of the stuff isn't bad in and of itself, but it's like, if you're going to narrow it down to, to all of existence revolving around just that, then it's going to be pretty anemic at best. So I guess my other expectation, though, would be that, yeah, sure, this movie is going to have going to be a mess and it's going to be woke and it's going to be feminist and it's going to be stupid. But Taika Waititi is fun and there will be lots of little jokes and fun parts and some maybe some halfway decent action better than the normal Marvel schlock. Like in moment to moment, maybe it'll have some entertainment value, even if it doesn't add up to much. Yeah. And but the fact is. The the jokes are actually pretty cheap and pretty lame, and it may have got a couple of laughs out of me, but they weren't especially willing. And I came with a lot of goodwill and desire to just be entertained. It was colorful. It was very colorful. And there was some decent action. There's a really, I think probably for me, the most fun action scene at the time was they go to a shadow world, and so everything's black and white, and it's this like moon type planet. and the action on that planet was actually, it was pretty fun, but they just, it was really hard to care about the movie. And he just leaned so hard into the joke is actually that Thor is the joke. And it just feels like a miscalculation because we already know Thor is pathetic. Like, like that's a character beat. And so 
it's not funny to see a pathetic person be pathetic. It's, what's funny is in Ragnarok, he's like a mock hero with big muscles and a cheesy swashbuckling grin on his face who then gets deflated or proves to be stupider than... It's, it's right. Like, and part of why that works is because he's been Kenneth Branagh's version of just the cheesy, heroic right. Avenger And, and the guy. most manosphere among us still want to see Kenneth Branagh's Thor get taken down a peg or two. Like, come on. Right. Right. And so that worked because it's just subverted those things in a kind of tongue in cheek way while still letting him be Mr. Awesome hero guy. And this one was just like, it leaned so hard into all that stuff. It's just like, it was just too much. And it wasn't, it wasn't clever or funny in my opinion. I just did not, didn't enjoy it. Well, I've probably said this on a podcast already, but there's this quote that just goes through my mind now with each new Marvel movie, which was Sam Raimi talking about Spider making Spider-Man 2, one of the great superhero movies of all time. And Sam Raimi saying, my philosophy as I go into this movie, I think he, this was an interview at the time. And he said, like, everyone's going to come and they're going to pay their ticket price. And they're going to like, we're, we've, we're already going to make all the money. We know people are there for it which means our job is to re-earn their affection. Like when you know someone's already going to buy your product, you can do one of two things. You can say they're already going to buy my product, therefore I can rest on my laurels. Or if you're a good person, you can say they're already going to buy my product no matter what, which means it is my duty to make sure the product is worth them buying. And so we have to make sure that we're reminding people of why they like Peter Parker, even though they think they already like Peter Parker. We have to make sure they're reinvesting in the romance with Mary Jane, even if they are showing up for it. We need to make sure that they're scared of this villain, even if they think they know who the villain already is. And that's just like what Marvel has completely lost the plot on and really has never had the plot since mm -hmm. maybe Iron Man 2 which had a, had that problem of, hey, you already like these people, so here they are doing more stuff, as opposed to, no, you actually have to design a scene that reminds us and tells us why we like Tony Stark again. You have to write dialogue that makes Tony Stark likable again. You have to reestablish. That's the problem with something like Iron Man. That's actually what, of the first Avengers, you don't have to love who Joss Whedon has been revealed to be, but... That's that's what's so smart about the first Avengers is that it sort of acts like its own movie. Right. Just Which like, I think it was the first Marvel movie I saw and I enjoyed it. I was right. like, I, I want to go and you introduced me to all these characters, but oh, there's they each have their own backstory movies. I want to go figure that out. Like, that's yeah. just kind of fun. Yeah. And it's always the problem with like a Ghostbusters 2 or a Men in Black 2 classic lame sequels where it's just like, hey, yeah, you already like Bill Murray. So here he is. Being Bill Murray. Being Bill Murray. It's like, no, you have to write a scene as good as the one where he's torturing that poor... Uh, and Thor. a lot of this really did feel like lazy writing. Like, here's a joke that lets us be lazy. Thor can't string a sentence together that makes any sense. Hey, we don't have to work on dialogue. Right. We'll just... That'll be a, a joke. And it's just like, oh, that's not a good joke, actually. And so all these places where sad, inarticulate puppy dog Thor is just supposed to, like carry everything because you already like him and feel bad for him because he's sad. And yet half the joke is just like, haha, isn't it funny that he feels so bad about himself and about the world and that, and people are confused because they want him to be a hero. And when he speaks, it's just like Valkyrie's trying to get people together because the children have been stolen and everybody's talking over each other. And then Thor is able to command the attention of the room and everybody looks at him and he's going to start to give a rousing speech about how they're going to go and get the children back. And then he just sort of peters out and it goes nowhere. And then he like, doesn't know what else to do except explode, grab his hammer and explode through the ceiling to go off by himself. And everybody's like, okay, I guess that was weird. Why is that a fun joke at this point? Why is that funny? Why do we think that's fun? We don't think that's funny. That sucks. Right. That really sucks. Like we're now more than we're into the halfway through the second act of this movie and Thor is just a, is still as impotent and sad and pathetic as, and this is like part of what we talked about. This with Spider-Man. Like you should come out of a Spider-Man movie. Wanting to be Spider-Man. Wanting to be Spider-Man mm -hmm. and excited about like jumping off of walls and shooting your web shooters and stuff like that. You don't come out of this Thor movie like 
there should be a little kid inside of me mm-hmm. who looks at Chris Hemsworth and says, hey, Chris Hemsworth is 6'3", and you're 6'3", and he's blonde, and you're blonde. and But also, he's like big and cool and awesome. You should want to be like that. Like, go to the gym, young man. Are there going to be a bunch of little girls that are going to come out and want to be Jane Foster? Maybe. I kind of doubt it. Actually. But I doubt it, yeah. I, I asked the question. I'm not asking the question rhetorically. It is actually a good question, but... There will be some girls that dress as Jane Foster's Mighty Thor for Halloween this year, but and there won't be any dudes that dress as Thor. I, yeah, but one of the problems with feminist filmmaking these days is that they, they, they do not try to crack the code of what an actual feminine superhero would be. She's It's always just an honorary boy. And honorary boys actually aren't as exciting, I think, ultimately to girls than a well, character that has some kind of girl trait that's been magnified somehow. And, right. and so you say, okay, Nathan, what does that look like? I don't know. But... But that is true, and that is all that she is. And, and it's also clear that she's only an honorary boy when she's holding a hammer. Right. Otherwise, she's a tiny, frail, emaciated little girl. Wahoo, that's empowering. Right. It makes me feel bad for Natalie Portman. They got her back. Yeah, I felt bad for Natalie Portman. I felt bad for Christian Bale. Man, I, I love Christian Bale. And I love uh, Christian Bale got so popular doing monotone Bruce Wayne stuff and talking like this, and everybody made fun of him. But he's such a great character actor. When he gets to play something fun and flamboyant, he's in, so much fun. In in this could have been a really fun thing, except he had nothing to play against. And he's not even in the same movie as any of these other characters because he's like what they have of him is like he's he starts the movie and he's supposed to be this like really vulnerable like dad who's devout and crying to the gods and praying to the gods. And his whole people have like all died and been massacred. And it's just him and his daughter left. And still to his daughter's dying breath, he's pleading to the gods and pleading his faithfulness. And then as soon as she dies, he, an oasis appears and he gets up to it. And the God that he's been praying to is there. And he's just like this fickle jerk who's laughing and doesn't care and just giving a really stupid cut and dry speech about there are always idiots who will worship me and I'm not worried. And, you know, and then he's got to turn and grab the necro sword and kill the God and now magically become the evil man. And he he's just like trying to carry like this weird tension of I'm that is, he has to, he knows he has to bring back at the end, which is I'm actually a really sad, pathetic, sympathetic dad figure who, is angry and and has no nuance. So now I'm stealing children from families, right? And and I can't distinguish between a a god like Thor who really does care and try to protect his people and the kids of his people and is going to go across the whole galaxy to to save these kids and risk his own life to save these kids. I can't make that distinction because all gods suck because my daughter died and they, my God didn't care about my daughter. And then at the end, he's got to turn all the way back around and be like, Oh man, I guess I really did suck. And I choose love. And so he's like trying to carry all this, the whole movie and with all these like tonal things to his performance. And then the whole rest of the movie is like, a cartoon. Mm-hmm. And then Russell Crowe's got his little moment in the, in the thing. And he goes hard in his performance, but he's playing Zeus who's fickle. And, but it's just like, we don't care about Thor. We eat grape. We have orgy. I have, I never saw that movie that came out at the very beginning of COVID, I think, or maybe somewhere in the middle where Russell Crowe played like a preacher. No, it's was like, he went crazy. He was a, I forget what it was. He was a stalker or he's somebody that went postal or, uh-huh. or something like that. But it feels like we're in this era of, we just want to mock and tear down Russell Crowe's dad energy that we all liked in the early two thousands. But now the he's gladiator and master and commander. Right. And... I mean, Russell Crowe is the quintessential dad actor. The, the guy that can bring that kind of natural grace and authority to a role that can elevate something like the man of steel, you know, yeah. where it's just like, I love Jor-El and the movie. It's not because the script is good. It's because Russell Crowe is Jor-El. Russell Crowe is Jor-El. 
And we were just talking about Gladiator last night for whatever mm-hmm. reason. And it's like he just carries that movie on his back. It's got some cool stuff. But Russell Crowe just brings so much. Yeah, he, he just completely carries that movie. He sells all of the really hammy lines. And he sells so many different things about the plot of that movie that in anybody in anybody else's hands could go sideways or feel really cheap or stupid in any number of ways. And he just like, he, he, he sells them so effortlessly just with his like masculine verve mm-hmm. that he brings, like you call it dad energy. But in, I think that's a good characterization because it's just like, yeah, I'd follow that guy. Yeah. That. I don't mean like, like Homer Simpson energy. I mean like actual dad energy, like who you'd want your dad to be yeah. energy. Like this, this is just good man, good old fashioned man energy yeah the kind of guy you would want you would you'd believe in and follow into battle actually well and master and commander is the ultimate example because he's got his dad joke he's got his weevil thing you just believe him and follow him through decisions like well i'm gonna have this guy flogged but i really don't want to but i should or i don't even remember whether that's an actual plot point from master commander but that kind of stuff his yeah. byplay the conflict that he has with bettany about what actually constitutes doing their job is interesting and compelling and you just buy that this is who this guy is and if he's going to make a hard decision that we don't necessarily agree with you still want to follow him in it and i just don't know of another man from his generation that quite had that i mean he really is kind of old-fashioned in that way like a gary cooper or something like that although gary cooper wasn't nearly as charismatic as russell crowe was in his prime yeah and now he's zeus and he's fat fat and he is a joke. And so, and, and Thor is all like puppy dog. This is my hero. I'm so excited to meet him. And it's definitely going to be one of those never meet your heroes kids kind of things, because actually he's just a stupid dopey blowhard. And which, which I take. So, and Thor is going to kill him with his own lightning bolt. Right. Which I take as a personal insult in some ways, because that's like Taika Waititi saying, well, you may have fallen for gladiator you idiot but yeah, stupid uh, you but i mean come on we know people like that don't exist and there, there's only one po- i've had two movie posters in my life as a as a teenager i had uh, velociraptors <laughs> and it said you are what i eat and i had maximus bowing in the coliseum with the sun dappled on him or something like that like i love that i love that character yeah he's as a awesome. young man and i saw that movie like five or six times in the theater and it's just like you're insulting me when you say Russell Crowe. You mean it would be like if you hired Cary Grant late in life to play a schlubby idiot that you're supposed to hate. It's like you're insulting everybody that was ever attracted to the image of Cary Grant. Yep. And yep. so I find that personally insulting, maybe maybe more than anything that you've described so far. So is there a case to be made? Like, will there be people? I, I think I've seen some people that we're friendly with say, Eh, it was kind of entertaining. It wasn't as bad as everybody said it was. I just don't know. I don't know how to make any positive case for it. The only the only virtue I see in it is it's a nice case study in the absolute head up its own butt deconstructionism that Marvel has become. Mm-hmm. Like this is really not this. This is unless you. I just don't know what you. I guess you could like seeing. Chris Hemsworth's naked backside, which we all knew was coming from the trailers. Right. Like, I guess you could like, I guess if you were in the right place at the right time emotionally, where the little sermonette about protecting yourself from vulnerability in love could actually be used by God to hit home some way or another. Yeah. But when that message is at the expense of any kind of good versus evil, at the expense of any kind of man, woman, at the expense of so many other truths that a movie should hold with equanimity, it's it's just like, yuck. I guess if you like the idea of, which they could do something good with it moving forward, the idea that Thor's new identity is a dad, even if it's a single dad. No, they'll just do the same dumb story that they always do with this kind of stuff where it's like he's protective and she wants to do cool stuff and she, and he just needs to get out of the way and realize that right. he has to let her go and he has to let her make her own choices. They, 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 
I mean, I just told you what Thor five is like, they, they, they do not have another plot that they will do with that. There is, you, I, I defy you to name another plot they'll do with his daughter. Yeah. There, there is no other daughter daddy plot and it works. It's really effective as, as someone whose firstborn child is a one year old daughter right now. It's, it's, there's a reason that that's what they do because it just, there's no dad who's not like, ah, I need to let my daughter grow up, grow up, become a woman, and become and... a woman. And I'm scared about that, but she has to make her own way. It's just like, it's, it works. Yeah. But it doesn't work morally or, but it, but it, it, it grabs your emotions. Anything else to say? Any, anything else a parent might want to know about this movie or. It's in your face. It's a waste of life. It's a waste of time. I just don't think that you will have any regrets missing it. And I think you will have it see it, have, in, have regrets seeing it, especially if you see it with your family. Well, there you go. How many lightning bolts out of four? Zero. Zero lightning bolts. So this, this is just a. I never want to see it again. I never want to think about it again. You really disliked it. I really hate this movie. So is this the worst Marvel movie? It may be the worst one that I've seen. I no, Captain Marvel's really bad. Captain Marvel's pretty bad. Maybe this is the movie that had the most chance of being good and squandered it the most. Well, I don't know. The Spider Man No Way Home movie was pretty squandered, but at least it had some moments in it that Yeah, I don't know that I would even say that that movie was exactly it was bad, but it was just kind of lame. It wasn't offensively bad or aggressively bad. Yeah. <sighs> All right. Sorry, Thor. Yep. Sorry. Sorry, Gore. Why didn't they call this movie Thor v, Thor v. Gore, Dawn of Justice? Because they're stupid. They missed a bet. Jane Foster. Poor Natalie Portman. Probably had to work out for like a year just to look like that. And they, she's one of those people that just never signs on for something that actually uses whatever she can do. I think she hates what she can do. Yeah. I do too. I do too. I think if we were living in a different era and she actually got to play and was had to play the good wife roles, she would do good at those. But Yeah, she could do the really sweet, sympathetic, almost, you could imagine her being a great version of Mary and It's a Wonderful Life if she wasn't so, hadn't become so hard. and Yeah. She actually brings a little bit of pathos to pregnant Padme and all that stuff. It's not an easy thing to do. Well, anyway, poor old Natalie Portman. I'll tell you who does not poor, though, is Seth, our Patron Choice Award of Awesomeness winner for today. Well, hey, Seth, you are awesome. What is it that makes Seth so awesome, do you think? I think it's his awesomeness. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. What do you think Seth would do if he had a hammer of lightning? If he had a hammer of lightning and it was the kind of thing he could break up into a million pieces. Mm Mm-hmm at will and send in a million different directions like Mando with his whirling birds or whatever mm-hmm. those things are. He would totally do that and kill all the bad guys. Hey, that's good. And oh. they'd be actual bad guys who deserve to die and he'd be doing it while he was protecting somebody. Yeah. He deserved protecting. I'm scanning my brain for joke people that I could say he could kill, but there's just nobody that we're going to be happy with. He, that's a real person. So I'm sorry, folks. Hitler. You bring back Hitler and kill him. Kill him. Yeah. That guy was a jerk. All right. Thank you, Seth. Thank you, listener. Until next time. Oh, did I mention how bad the music is in this movie? No. I'm surprised. The music, the, the score was good in Thor 3. It's just in your face with Guns N' Roses the whole way in a way that's just bad. I guess we go to some planet with a, a city and we play Paradise City. Yep. Probably. Yep, we do. Yep. It's amazing. November so, November rain when something's sad, I, maybe. It's just like we're going to use Guns N' Roses the way we did Led Zeppelin in the last one. So, yeah. Yeah, well, even 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 Led Zeppelin was overused in the last one. I think it should have only happened at the end. It shouldn't have happened at the beginning, too. Although both of those sequences are cool. But you've got to parse these things out, Taika. You can't overuse them. Yep, well, he did. Anyhow, until next time... It's hammer time. <laughs>